I'm a Bombayite, so I like the groove in Bombay and I like the smell. I like when I come from the airport, I like the smell of Bombay. Bombay is the most prosperous city of a vast and populous country. It's the industrial dynamo of India and the production base for Bollywood movies with billions of fans worldwide. Seven islands like bean strings linked by bridges and causeways make up the sea cuddled city. It's a soup that has all, you put fish, chicken, everything in this gumbo. You know, and that's just the same way Bombay is a gumbo also. with all these different music through the training of my own system, Carnatic music, South Indian music. Gurtu plays regularly with John McLaughlin and has just completed a concert tour with Joe Zavino. His latest album, Living Magic, was named Hi-Fi CD of the Month while he was rehearsing for this concert. I heard John Coltrane playing the blues with uh, Elvin Jones. That's when I got turned on to playing jazz. <laughs> Don Cherry is an original spirit of world music. He's played alongside most jazz greats and other brilliant musicians from all over the world. His latest album, Multikutti, was voted San Francisco's outstanding jazz album of 91. We've all come from so many different edges of the world, I mean, from whether it be Africa, India, England, America, all over. There's a meeting point, and the meeting point is the music. The music I've been, uh, first was a, in contact with was Latin music, and uh, from having an American Indian background, and the point of ritual and music has always been important. But from studying um, with these different teachers I've studied with, Ornette, uh, Thelonious Monk, you could say, and John Coltrane, and coming through the jazz world of bebop music, it's important for me to reali realize that it's all development. You know, I don't believe there's perfection, but you can have development, you know. Um, you know, all the cars and all the commotion, all this is a groove. You hear a lot of music. You hear the doors of taxi or anything, all the sounds. Bombay is one of the finest cities, and it has so much energy, especially for music, and it has produced some amazing musicians. Yeah, you can see that Bombay is a funky, funky town. <laughs> if you really know, you can really get around. Bombay is a funky, funky town. <laughs> <laughs> 
This film is based around a concert held in Bombay on New Year's Day. Shankar and his wife Caroline flew in from Los Angeles to play at the concert. Trilok Gurtu came from Germany, Viku Vinayakaran from Madras, and from San Francisco, Don Cherry. There's a nursery rhyme that offers an excellent metaphor for overcrowded Bombay. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. So she gave them some broth without any bread and whipped them all soundly and sent them to bed. Shankar was trained by his father in the disciplines of South Indian Carnatic music. He designed his electronic double violin himself. The two necks, with five strings each, cover the full range of violin, viola and cello. In the 70s, Shankar and John McLaughlin formed the band Shakti. He has since played or collaborated with many of the world's top jazz and rock musicians. memory of my father, V. Lakshmi Narayana, and this is the first world music festival, Lakshmi Narayana festival in Bombay. We had the same festival in America a few months ago in San Francisco and Los Angeles. And I have toured with Dawn and Trilog of Inak Rama Caroline. But this is the first time all the five of us are touring as a band. And I'm very happy to be here in Bombay. It's like the New York of India.
music here is made up of improvisation. And that's important with us. And that's one of the reasons that we've all come together, to improvise together, to tune in our hearts together, and to swing together.
Vikhu Vinayakaran on the Gatam is so sought after that he performs sometimes at three concerts a day in his native Madras. The Gatam is a clay water pot reinforced with iron hoops for use as a musical instrument. Caroline Shankar has been composing music and performing together with her husband Shankar for more than 10 years. They have also formed a rock group called The Epidemics. I find Bombay is always a very, very exciting place to play because they're so hungry and they're so enthusiastic and vocal about the music and very straight about how they feel about the music. So. It's always um, quite a challenge. I've been brought up with a North Indian family tradition. My mother is a classical singer, so i been playing tabla since my childhood. A poor life this, if full of care. We have no time to stand and stare. Bombay's citizens have obviously taken to heart these lines from a W.H. Davis poem taught in the schools. People enrich their lives a little by making time to stop and watch whatever's going on. Twelve million people bed down in the city of gold. More pour in every day from the countryside to escape the vagaries of village life. But finding a place to live in Bombay can be a drama of desperation. The poor settle where they can, on the streets, on wasteland, a lean-to against a wall. They also build hutments on the construction sites where they work reclaiming land from the sea. Ordinary citizens inhabit small blocks of flats or cling to their bungalows and chawls, often tumble down relics of a Bombay that was more spacious and easygoing. The nouveau riche reside in high-rise apartments which gnaw the skyline and colonize air space, often over land reclaimed from the sea. With a paucity of privies and privacy at a premium, the Bombay seashore accommodates both bums and lovers. Love has pitched his mansion in the place of excrement, for nothing can be sole or whole that has not been rent. These lines by W.B. Yeats could as well refer to this Bombay shore as to a body. Ablutions in the morning and after the sea has flushed away the flotsam and jetsam, love in the afternoon. Bombay maintains a veneer of exuberant bedlam in spite of everything, and you're sure to find music wherever you go.
Ricky Correa is 79, born in Mombasa, East Africa, brought up in Goa in India, studied music in Karachi, now in Pakistan. He became leader of Bombay's best-known band at the Taj Mahal Hotel before the Second World War and stayed there for more than 21 years until in 1961, serious illness obliged him to give it up. While at the Taj, he played host to many visiting jazz men. Now, this is Dave Brubeck's Quint Quartet. This is Paul Desmond, Joe Morello. This is Red Nichols. Uh, Dave Brubeck came here in 1955 and he gave few jazz concerts. And Red Nichols came in 1960. Dave Brubeck again here. I'm sitting here. We had some uh, discussions about music, Indian music and Western music. We all joined there. Mostly Indian rhythm players and tablas and all played. Sonny Rollins, he came to India in 1968, saying that I want to go to the Himalayas and he knew he would find the answer here. He had no guru, he didn't know where to go, he had no address where to land up. And somebody sitting next to him on the plane said, hey, look, quiet. when you are at Bombay airport, check out this ashram near the Bombay airport, which is Swami Chinmayanand's ashram. Sonny went to check it out, didn't go to the Himalayas, stayed in Bombay for three months. We became very good friends. And he did a deep study of Vedanta and Gita. Uh, Meenat Ferguson came to India also looking for answers and, uh, you know, he was also very inspired by both Indian music and Indian spiritual things. And to get the Indian uh, microtonal techniques on his trumpet, which is very difficult to do, he added a little slide, like a trombone, on his trumpet. It's, he's patented this and, you know, he used this, that to create the microtonal effects in his trumpet playing. Charles Mingus was deeply into Indian things and unfortunately he, was, he knew he was dying of cancer and he told his wife, so Mingus, I want my body to be cremated in the Hindu way and I want my ashes to be put in an urn and immersed in the river Ganges. Now, this we are talking about Charles Mingus, you know, somebody at the level of Duke Ellington, a musician of this stature. His ashes, Susan Mingus, flew to India and immersed his ashes in the river Ganges at Haradwar. One big gap where there is a lot of room for development is in the vocal techniques of jazz. You know, jazz has developed instrumentally to such a high level but jazz singers don't know how to develop their techniques. An average Indian classical singer, the amount of work she has to or he has to put in to develop the voice to do things like gamaks and tans, if this can be done in jazz, it will have a new revolution in jazz and it will bring jazz back. It's the only, only important musical culture on earth where there is such a wide imbalance between the instrumental and the vocal part of it. Jazz has always kept on evolving and developing. It absorbed from all cultures around the world. Indian music was a source of inspiration. Having exploited all the harmony complexities, the way out was to enter into rhythmic complexities. Uh, other than the polyrhythms which you have in Africa, our ryth rhythms are uh, incredible, especially the Karnatak uh, rhythms.
started my career, I was an out and out jazz musician. I loved jazz and I only wanted to play jazz. To make a living out of jazz in India is a, it's a hard climb, I guess. Uh, I've experienced it myself. The only way for a musician to do something over here is uh, join the film industry where he gets a regular income or join the nightclubs and play popular music. Jazz India wanted to form a fusion band. They asked me and I looked out for some musicians. Then we got together a sound, named the group Sangam, and Jazz India lined up a tour for us, Europe, which was very successful. We did about 50 concerts in Europe, came back, and then did nothing. I had a choice of either taking a regular, you know, job or music, and I think I, I chose music, and I, I'm really happy I did that. <laughs> I want to have a good time, you know. I want to celebrate and have have a lot of fun playing. That's what it's all about for me. The real money comes in from doing jingles and you know, working in studio. Basically, we're living off the studio environment, not uh, live gigs. But we hope to, you know, Ranjit and me put a band together, so we're trying to create a very distinct Indian sound, because I think we need to put that sound on the map. It's about time. Yeah. I think that there has to be a more of an effort on the part of the bands and that of the audience. I think, really, we have to have faith in each other and uh, uh, keep that, because the bands have to slick their act a little more. We have to play more together. We have to be able to translate our life's experiences here into the music. And audiences, I'm sorry, have to hang in there and wait for us to get it together so we can come out and give them what they want. Twenty years ago, Bombay loved its jazz bands. Then the disco beat defeated them. And only now is jazz making a slow comeback. But for perseverance, at least, there's nothing to beat those who sing for their supper on Bombay's trains.
trains are a lifeline of Bombay. Packed to bursting during peak hours, they disgorge millions of passengers into banks and offices each morning, draining them off as an hourglass does in the evening. Bombay has spirit as well as spirituality. In spite of the crowds and the claustrophobia, people make a space for inner calm, for intimations of infinity. It ebbs and flows through the city like the sea, for there are places of worship everywhere. Hindu, Sikh, Muslim, Christian, Parsi, Buddhist, Jewish. musician herself accompanied her late husband, the legendary saxophonist John Coltrane, on keyboard. They shared a keen interest in Indian music and spiritualism. Giving alms is traditional for all Bombay's religions. It's good for the soul. Those who believe in reincarnation say that it ensures a better life next time round. principles. It seemed to embody a language in itself that was spiritual in nature.
the involvement really began with John Coltrane himself. He had had a great interest in Eastern philosophy, Eastern thought, Eastern music, Eastern spirituality. We were attracted by the sound. The sound was devotional. The sound was um, spiritual. The sound, it was a sound of energy, a sound of life, a sound of peace, even. If it were possible to realize God through music, I, I know that John Coltrane would have realized God. Right after it was finished, someone said, oh, this isn't a real temple. This is simply a set. I told them it didn't matter to me whether this was a temple or not a temple, because the temple of God is within. And this is what I experienced, that I was in the temple of God, in a holy place, because of the music. The music was so beautiful, and it was so devotional, so wonderful. Traditions an anchor in an urban storm, as well as a ball and chain.
guitar comes from West Africa. This guitar comes from Mali in West Africa. The people speak a language called Bambara. And in Mali in West Africa, this guitar is called Duzongoni. Duzongoni.